Chesapeake Bay Oysters, Past, Present, and Future One of the most famous and recognizable species in the Chesapeake Bay, Chrysostria virginica, or the eastern oyster, once really abundant, is now less than 1% of what the population once was. In this five-part webinar, we will explore the decline of the oyster population in the Chesapeake, why oysters are needed in the bay, and talk about some of the science and restoration projects to bring oysters back. My name is Christine Thompson, and I am a researcher at the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Sciences Horn Point Laboratory, and we will feature other scientists at our laboratory who are involved in this research in order to shed some light on the importance of oysters to society and to the ecosystem. What happened to all the oysters? Part 1, A History of Oysters in the Chesapeake Bay. My name is uh, Victor Kennedy. I'm a professor at the Horn Point Laboratory, and I've been studying the history of the oyster industry for some time. And I'm going to tell you factors that had an influence on the oyster population to the point where it's now very, very low. In the 1600s, the early settlers who came to Chesapeake Bay found oyster beds that uh, were so extensive that they reached up to the surface of the Chesapeake Bay and at low tide sometimes ships could run aground. So I'm going to show you some pictures of the rise and decline in the fishery. Using this sort of graph you see on the left hand side millions of Maryland bushels. Oysters being harvested were placed in baskets that were about a bushel in size going from 1840 to the year 2000. So early on there was an increase in the number of bushels that were being harvested and it reached the point that the Maryland General Assembly put forward a license system and established oyster police to monitor those people who had a license to tong for oysters or dredge for oysters. There was also a survey of oysters. Meanwhile, the railroad was going across the mountains to the west and the CNO Canal opened up so there was an expansion of transportation that meant that the oysters harvested in Chesapeake Bay could be transported to other parts of the United States and Canada for sale. So back in the late 1800s, the oyster industry was very large. Here we have pictures of oyster shuckers and there were a large number of oyster packing establishments. There were about uh, 50 or 60 in Baltimore, for example, and the, the lower picture shows you a variety of different oyster cans ranging from pints to gallons and the names of the oysters that were being packed in those cans and sold. So the industry in the 1880s uh, harvested uh, both in Maryland and Virginia uh, about 29 million bushels of oysters. The people employed in this were estimated to be as many as 26,000. Some of those were fishermen, a few thousand fishermen or watermen as we call them in Maryland. And then the people who worked uh, shucking the oysters, putting them into uh, cans, they included the can makers and included the people who were involved in this industry. There were about 4,200 tonging and dredging boats licensed in this as well. And it was estimated that about 400 million pounds of oysters were in the bay in the 1880s. Oysters were being shipped around the country. In the lower left you see a picture of a card that D&D &D Mallory and Company would give out to people indicating that they had this diamond brand oyster and above that you see a mention of the diamond brand oysters being sold by an agency in Detroit. In the middle you see a picture of a meat market in Mankato, Minnesota and they're advertising that they had oysters for sale. And on the right you see an advertisement for a facility, Oyster Saloon and Depot in St. Louis, Missouri, and they advertised that they had New York and Baltimore oysters, and oysters could be delivered to saloons and private houses in any part of the city free of charge. In this postcard taken from 1905, you see dredging boats. These are boats that would go out and dredge the oysters, and they would come in, and you can see a large number of these boats uh, tied up at the wharf in Baltimore. There were hundreds of dredge boats at that time. Okay, after the uh, period of time in the 1880s when there was a tremendous harvest of oysters, the oysters started to decline in numbers because of this over-harvesting activity. This caused a lot of concern. There were efforts to try and get aquaculture started, leasing the bottom to people who wanted to grow oysters on the bottom. There was a conservation commission established to oversee the harvest of oysters. 
and there was a survey of the natural bars that went all over Maryland to see where are the oyster bars and what condition are they in. Also, because of the need to put oyster shell on the bottom so that larvae, the uh, young oysters, will have something to settle on, uh, the state inaugurated a 10% shell tax on the processors. 10% of the processors' shells that they got after they had taken the oyster body out were to be given back to the state to be put on appropriate oyster bars. But we see this decline going on uh, until about the 1940s or 50s. Increased demand led to increased harvest. Here we see in a skipjack, a, a, a dredge boat with dredges, one on each side. One dredge would go over and be dragged along the bottom as the boat sailed along. And then when it was brought up, the other dredge was put over. And you can see the oysters piled up on deck. The early harvest gear was very simple, and a lot of it still is. You see it on top, a dredge that is powered by human activity. On the left and the bottom, you see tongs and on the right you see mechanical tongs. On the tongs on the left, the shaft tongs, uh, a person who would be standing on the side of his boat could harvest about 8 to 25 bushels of oysters a day. So it wasn't terribly efficient. Here is a picture of dredging in the 1880s, human-powered dredging. That was replaced by engines later on and became more efficient. Here we see a picture of tongs of 100 years ago, still goes on these days. Somebody standing on the edge of the boat using those shaft tongs and then mechanical tongs were invented uh, 100 years ago or more in which they would drop to the bottom and then as they were winched back up they would close on whatever they had dropped onto on an oyster bed and those oysters would be brought up and dumped on that platform. Now all of this meant that the oysters were being taken from the bay, they were being shucked and the shell was left behind. And here you see a pile of shell in uh, one shucking house in Chesapeake Bay that had accumulated over the course of a year. What you see now in this new graph is that there was a period of stability in terms of two or three million oysters being harvested in the 50s and 60s, and then the estate was requiring 50% of a processor's shell go back and be put on the bottom. There was a shell dredging program as well to try and rehabilitate the system. Unfortunately, disease started to be a problem. And uh, disease came in, uh, one disease is called MSX. You see it showing up in 1959, and it spread through the bay. And another disease, dermo, that had been in the bay, we believe, became a bigger problem later in the 80s. And you can see the continuing decline in the harvest of oysters. These diseases don't affect humans, but both dermo and MSX can result in the death of adult oysters. So let's sum up by looking at causes and declines 125 years ago. Millions of bushels of oysters harvested, tens of thousands of people employed, a third of a million acres of suitable habitat, and then there was the overfishing and habitat destruction by taking the shell away and not putting it back. So 50 years ago, we're down to a few million bushels and only 200,000 acres of suitable habitat. That continued and disease entered into the equation so that now, we believe there's only about uh, a tenth of 100,000 bushels being harvested yearly compared with millions a few years ago. Fewer number of watermen and processing companies and the habitat has been so disturbed and covered over with silt that the acreage is very much less. So the losses for society, there are fewer watermen uh, because there's fewer oysters. Their processing plants are shutting down. Restaurants have to buy oysters from other parts of the country and you no longer see these dredging sailboats out there working the way they used to, so the cultural heritage is lost. We invited Captain Ben Parks, a fourth generation waterman on the Chesapeake Bay, to share his thoughts on the state of the oyster fishery today. I'm Ben Parks. I was born, raised on Hooper's Island, worked the bulk of my entire commercial fishery in the lower part of Chesapeake Bay and its tributaries. Both of my great grandfather, my grandfather, my father, myself, and I got a son that works for me, so we're in the fifth generation. But it's 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 been it's been a change. As according to him, it, it was more it was more dredge boats on the bay that that my grandfather owned than what's on the whole entire bay now. It's a dr dramatic decline through the 70s, late 70s, real good probably in 80, 80 up through about 93, 94. The oyster industry was was pretty good if you 
if you went to an oyster bar and you couldn't catch eight or ten bushel an hour, you went somewhere where you could. So it 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 got good through those years. Now it's kind of slid the other way. Now most of the good hand tong bars are now sanctuaries. I sailed by James's aunt yesterday. Very little bit of that left. If you go to Hubbard's aunt where I work and, and was raised, there's the little harbor where my brother and my father and all of us harbor that was 13 boats in there and it hasn't been one in there since 1995 it's gone that's like riding into a ghost town my grandparents house that's somebody way from here owns that somebody way from here just bought my mom's house just nobody down there left and it's it's it, it, it's kind of heartbreaking to, to, to see that happen it's it's not just here it's happening everywhere i truly don't know of uh, but one waterman that I grew up with, 100% of his time has been spent as a waterman. I, I've done the same thing, my dad done the same thing. Most of the young boys now, it's, it's, it's easier to find a job working for a gunning club in the wintertime, knowing that, hey, that paycheck's gonna come every week. It's, it's been a lot of watermen that's figured that out, and which has helped the watermen who harvest oysters. I, I think that the watermen of the future, that's just, you're looking at retired people that's going to be buying in to subsidize their retirement income. I just, it, it's changed that dramatically, you know. I would like to see it, it, it get back to where the, the younger guys, and I was kind of hoping that, you know, maybe with all the restoration work that's being done that they'll be able to follow in the footsteps of their fathers and grandparents and great grandparents, like I've been able to do. I like to see it, it, it be here for their future, like it was for mine.